has a number of different beginnings, but for me, it really began in 2005 when my Austrian governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I won't attempt an Austrian accent, uh, made an announcement that the state of California, along with another, uh, a number of other western states, including Washington, Oregon, and the uh, Canadian province of British Columbia, would commit to making Kyoto-level cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. And when he made this commitment, he said, I say the debate is over. We know the science, we see the threat, and we know the time for action is now. Well, it's not every day you get to agree with a politician, but I did, <laughs> especially a Republican. No, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> and at that time, around 2003, 2004, 2005, it seemed that the American people agreed. Indeed, a major poll by the Gallup Polling Organization in 2007 showed that 72% of us were completely or mostly convinced that global warming caused by humans was underway. Indeed, 62% of us believe that life on Earth would continue without major disruptions only if society takes immediate and drastic action to reduce global warming. And even many former contrarians seem to have come around at that time. One of them was the Republican pollster Frank Luntz, who in 2006 said, it's now 2006. So he was off to a good start, he got the year right. <laughs> I think most people would conclude that there is global warming taking place, and that the behavior of people are affecting the climate. Now, Luntz was important, famous, some might say infamous, because he was the author of a memo to Republican candidates running for office in 2003 in which he addressed the issue of the vulnerability of Republican candidates on environmental issues. Opinion polls consistently showed that the vast majority of American people do believe that the federal government has a role to play in protecting the environment, and Republicans were considered vulnerable on that issue, and particularly on the issue of climate change. So he advised candidates to use the phrase climate change rather than global warming because he said, climate change is a lot less frightening. Moreover, he went on to say that the way Republicans could win this debate was to reframe it in terms of scientific uncertainty, to insist, to emphasize the uncertainties, and to insist that there was no consensus among scientific experts. And so he wrote, and all of the emphasis here is his, the scientific debate remains open. Voters believe that there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. Should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate. Well, was Luntz's position factually correct? The short answer is no. As was said in the introduction, I study scientific consensus and dissent. I had published a paper in 2004 that had looked exactly at this question. And of course, what we knew was that in 2001, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the world's leading organization of scientific researchers who study the issue, collect data, and publish it in peer-reviewed journals, had said, human activities are modifying the concentration of atmospheric constituents that absorb or scatter radiant energy. Most of the observed warming over the last 50 years is likely to have been due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. Now that was in 2001, so two years before the Luntz memo. But in fact, the science had actually coalesced even earlier. In 1995, in the second assessment report of the IPCC, the scientific experts who had reviewed the data had concluded that the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human impact on global climate. Now, in my own research, I had examined the question, or I had posed the question, just because the leadership of a scientific organization says something, that doesn't prove that it's consistent with the, what the rank and file believe. So if you really want to know what working, ordinary rank and file scientists believe about a matter, you have to see, you have to ask what have they published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. And so that's what I did in 2004. I did an analysis of the peer-reviewed scientific literature using the database of the information, the Institute for Scientific Information, and our analysis of the literature from 1990 to 2000 showed when we asked the question, how many papers published in peer-reviewed journals disagree with that consensus statement or provide evidence to refute that consensus statement? The answer was none, not one. So that was, I thought, a pretty significant result. And so <laughs> I thought it was kind of significant. Actually, at first I didn't, but no. Uh, it's like a lot of things, you know, you kind of stumble across something that takes a little time to actually absorb the significance of your own work. So I published it in Science in 2004, and this result surprised many people. In fact, it angered many people. It caused some people to send me death threats, which was really a very strange thing. 
Because nobody sent a death threat to President George H.W. Bush when he signed the Framework Convention, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, which committed the United States, along with 192 other signatories, to preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system based on the emergent scientific consensus that we were indeed interfering in the climate system in a dangerous way. Now, when our first President Bush signed the Framework Convention, in 1992, he called on world leaders to translate the written document into concrete action to protect the planet. So my co-author and I, Eric Conway, became interested in these two questions. What happened? Why didn't we take those concrete steps that our president, our first President Bush, promised us and promised the world? So what I'd like to do tonight is to give you an extremely brief history of the evolution of climate science, just a few key highlights and then tell the story of the emergence of a political challenge to that science. So this is the story of Merchants of Doubt. It is the story of selling uncertainty along the lines of that Luntz memo, of emphasizing doubt, and of insisting that there's no consensus among scientific experts, and motivated, a big part of our story was to explain the motivation, motivated by a doctrinaire belief in free markets, born, nurtured, and hardened in the Cold War. So a good place to begin the story is with the work of John Tyndall, the Irish experimentalist who first established the concept of a greenhouse gas. In a series of experiments in the 1850s, Tyndall showed that certain gases, most notably water vapor and carbon dioxide, have a distinctive property of being highly transparent to visible light, but relatively opaque to infrared. So these gases allow visible light from the sun to penetrate the atmosphere rather readily, but then when infrared radiation is re-emitted to space from the Earth, it tends to be trapped by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Now, Tyndall recognized that this was a good thing because without greenhouse gases, the Earth would be as cold as the Moon or Mars and quite inhospitable for life. About 50 years later, around the turn of the century, Svante Arrhenius, a Swedish geochemist, recognized that when you burn fossil fuels, it produces a byproduct of carbon dioxide a greenhouse gas. And therefore, the burning of fossil fuels would be expected to lead to an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that increase could change the radiative balance, could change the heat balance of the planet and make the planet warmer. Arrhenius did the first calculations of what the effect of doubling carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would be and calculated that it would increase the average temperature of the globe as a whole by one and a half to four and a half degrees Celsius, or as much as eight to nine degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Now, Arrhenius was Swedish, so he thought global warming would be a good thing. <laughs> the first person to suggest that it might not be such a good thing was this man, Guy Stewart Callender, a British steam engineer, who in 1938 published the first article in a peer-reviewed scientific journal suggesting that carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels was actually, in fact, already beginning to increase, and that possibly the temperature was beginning to increase as well. Now, that was in 1938 quite a while ago. The following year, war broke out in Europe. Calendar became involved in war work. Many scientists went off to work on other problems. And the issue wasn't really revisited until the 1950s, or not revisited in a serious way. Now, at that point, people began to discuss one important uncertainty in this whole question, which was the competing effect of water vapor. So I already mentioned that Tyndall had recognized way back 100 years earlier that Water vapor is also an important, carbon, uh, important greenhouse gas. And so some people argue that given how much water vapor is in the atmosphere, any small addition of carbon dioxide would not have very much effect. And this is, by the way, an argument that some skeptics and contrarians still try to push today. And it's worth mentioning because it is, this argument is still recycled today, 50 years later. Sometimes people say conservatives don't believe in recycling, but they do recycle refuted arguments. <laughs> So one refuted argument that they love to recycle is this one, an argument that was refuted in the 1950s by Gilbert Plass, who was a pioneer in upper atmosphere spectroscopy. Plass resolved the absorption bands of water, va water vapor seen here and carbon dioxide seen here, here, and here, and showed that, by and large, they did not, in fact, overlap very substantively. And therefore, additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would be expected to have a substantive warming effect. Plass's work had a profound impact on two oceanographers in my home institution, the University of California, Hans Seuss and Roger Revelle. 
1957, Ravel was working on the planning for the International Geophysical Year. And as a part of that planning, he began to think about the possibility of doing systematic observations of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And he pointed out that by burning fossil fuels, humans were taking carbon dioxide stored in rocks over the course of hundreds of millions of years of geological time. And in a very short period of time, just a few decades to a century, we were, we were returning large amounts of that stored carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. And in doing so, he argued mankind was performing a great geophysical experiment. And so he argued for and obtained the funding to begin the measurements of carbon dioxide as part of the International Geophysical Year. And those measurements became the life work of another professor at the University of California, Charles David Keeling, who in 1958 began the systematic measurement of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, which he continued until his death a few years ago, and which his son Ralph continues even today. So Keeling began this work in 1958, and within a few years, by 1965, he was convinced that his own data did indeed show a small but steady increase in carbon dioxide from about 315 parts per million when he began the work in 1958 to about 320 by 1965. By the way, where are we at now? Yeah, just under 400, about 395. So we're up here like heading towards Keeling's face. <laughs> As a result of these preliminary data, Keeling and Ravel concluded that it would be important to begin to communicate with policy uh, officials, government officials, about what this might mean. And so in 1965, as part of the President's Science Advisory Committee, they wrote a report in which they wrote, in which they said, by the year 2000, there will be about 25% more CO2 in our atmosphere than at present, and this will modify the heat balance of the atmosphere to such an extent that market changes in climate could occur. Now, we often complain that politicians don't listen to scientists, but at that time, at least one did. That year, Lyndon Johnson, in a special message to Congress, said, this generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. So that was President Lyndon Johnson in 1965. In 1965, we knew that we were altering the chemistry of the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels. But in 1965, President Johnson had a few other things to worry about, and not much serious or sustained issue in the issue was generated in policy circles. That began to change, though, a few years later with a scientific development, the rise of numerical simulation modeling. That is to say, the use of fast digital computers to begin to build computer models, computer simulations of the world's climate system. And for the first time, it began to be possible to model the dynamics of the atmosphere in a quasi-realistic way and to consider long-term trends, or as some people put it, to revisit the calendar question. And these models began to confirm the earlier predictions of Calendar and Arrhenius that doubling CO2 would in fact lead to substantive changes in the average temperature of the globe and a whole set of other impacts that then would ensue from that. In the 1970s, then, we see a series of reports being issued from a number of different organizations, the World Meteorological Organization, the National Research Council, the National Oceanographic Agency, uh, the US Department of Energy, the National Academy of Sciences, all of whom begin to discuss what the scientific results are showing and what they mean from a policy standpoint. These various reports led the US National Academy of Sciences to conclude that a plethora of studies from diverse sources indicates a consensus that climate changes will result from man's combustion of fossil fuels and changes in land use. If you go on the internet and you are interested in reading people who attack me, one of the things they like to attack me over is this issue of scientific consensus. There's a new project that just started in Australia of a group of climate contrarians who call themselves the Galileo Project. I mean, this is kind of the, the narcissism of this is unbelievable. Um, and one of the things they like to say is that science isn't about consensus. It's about heroic individuals who reject the conventional wisdom. Well, actually, science is about consensus. And this is the US National Academy of Sciences saying so. So this isn't my word. This is their words. This is how the scientists themselves thought about their own work, a kind of emerging consensus of opinion based on scientific research and data. So in 1979, there was a consensus that global warming would happen, that it was expected to occur. So this, in effect, is a consensus about an expectation, a prediction. 
I teach history of science at the University of California. And one of the things I always emphasize with my students is that we often think about scientific discovery as an event, a eureka moment. But really, scientific discovery is not an event. It's a process. And it unfolds over time and often in stages. So here we see what I consider to be the first stage of the scientific consensus, the consensus about an expectation of what would happen in the future. There was also a consensus that it was not a small concern. That is to say that these changes would matter. So again, the National Research Council, writing on this question, said in 1979, the close linkage between man's welfare and the climatic regime within which his society has evolved suggests that such climatic changes would have, a profound, would have profound impacts on human society. But the big question, the question about which there was not yet a consensus, was when. When would these changes be likely to occur? One scientist I interviewed for this project was part of a group that briefed the Carter administration on this question in 1979. And one official in the White House asked the scientist, well, when is all this going to happen? And he said, well, I don't know, maybe 40 years. And the White House official said, please come back in 39. <laughs> so the surprising result was when it was not 40 years later, but it was six. Six years later, NASA climate modeler Jim Hansen and his team at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, part of NASA, concluded from their scientific data that the human signal, the human fingerprint on the climate system was in fact now detectable. Hansen testified this in the US Congress, saying that he was 99% certain of this result. And it was this result and all of the data around it that had led in part to the creation of the IPCC in that same year. But it also led to something else. It led to a politically motivated campaign to challenge that consensus and to cast doubt upon, upon the science and the scientists. The campaign focused on the claim that the science was unsettled, and therefore it would be premature to act to do anything about this alleged problem. As a historian, I'm interested in origins. And the shocking discovery that Eric Conway and I made was that the origins of this claim could be traced back to a small handful of people. Now today, as you all know, there's doubt about climate science being promoted in many quarters, uh, from the Bush White House to Fox News to the pages of the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fortune, and many other places. But one of the most important sources of disinformation about climate change, going back to 1988, going back to this very moment when the scientific consensus first co coalesced, is a think tank in Washington, DC, named the George C. Marshall Institute. For more than 20 years now, the Marshall Institute has either denied the reality of anthropogenic climate change or denied the reality of climate change, or if they accepted that there might, in fact, be some global warming, denied that it was caused by people. So where did the Marshall Institute come from? And why do they promote doubt about climate science? The Marshall Institute was founded in 1984 by three men, all physicists, all distinguished, all prominent, all who have, had built their careers in the Cold War weapons and rocketry programs. So on the left, we see Robert Jastrow, the head, an astrophysicist who was head of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, had worked on the early rocketry programs and the Apollo missions. On the right, William Nuremberg, a nuclear physicist who had worked on uranium separation for the Manhattan Project, and later on many Navy-sponsored projects related to submarine-launched ballistic missiles, uh, anti-submarine warfare, mine detection, and other uh, Cold War military issues. And in the center, Frederick Seitz, a solid state physicist who was a student of Eugene Wigner, often considered to be one of the fathers of the atomic bomb, because Wigner helped convince Albert Einstein to write his famous letter to FDR, imploring FDR to consider the possibility of building an atomic bomb. Seitz was also the president of the National Academy of Sciences in the early 1960s and president in the 1970s of the Rockefeller University. These three men had known each other for a long time. They had worked on many advisory committees, including uh, two of the three had worked as science advisor in NATO. And in the early 1980s, they found themselves working together on an advisory panel to the Reagan administration on the question of the Strategic Defense Initiative, or what most of us know of as Star Wars. The vast majority of scientific experts opposed the Strategic Defense Initiative, arguing that it would be hugely costly it would probably not work, and if it did work, that would, be a, a, that would be worse because it would destabilize the balance of terror, which had maintained the peace during the Cold War. 
Over 6,500 American scientists and engineers signed a petition declaring a boycott of SDI program funds. But Jastrow, Seitz, and Nuremberg disagreed with those 6,500. And in 1984, they created the Marshall Institute to defend SDI against this overwhelming scientific consensus against it and to promote the continuing importance of science and technology in the national defense, in part by insisting on the reality of Soviet strength and the anxiety or worry of US weakness. Now, I don't have time here to talk about all the ways in which they did this. It's a complicated story. It's described in the book. But I'll just give you my favorite example. This is an article that Robert Jastrow wrote, published in the National Review. America has five years left. Now, at the same time, Frederick Seitz had retired from the Rockefeller University. And he had taken on one last job, and that was working as a consultant to the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Corporation, where he sponsored a biomedical research program, had $45 million to sponsor research that could challenge the scientific consensus on the harms of tobacco. The principal strategy of this research program was what we and others have called doubt-mongering to fund research that could raise doubts, to fund research into other causes of cancer, to find experts who would say, well, you know, I'm not really sure. I'm a bit agnostic about this. I really don't think that the scientific jury is out. Uh, cancer is a very complicated disease. And to insist that the science was unsettled. And therefore, that because the science was unsettled, it would be irrational, premature, maybe even a little hysterical, to control tobacco use. In 1989, these two strands of the story came together. The Berlin Wall fell, rather rapidly and unexpectedly. The Soviet Union began to disintegrate. So you might have thought that these old cold warriors would be vindicated, that they'd be happy, that they'd open the champagne and celebrate the fact that their work had achieved exactly what they had always hoped it would, the dominance of the West over the Soviet Union. But instead of being happy, they found a new enemy. They found a new set of reds under the bed to fight. And that new enemy was what they called environmental extremism, what they considered to be the exaggeration of environmental threats by people with a left-wing political agenda. And they applied the tobacco strategy to insist that the science was unsettled. Doubt is our product, ran the infamous memo written by one tobacco industry executive in 1969 since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. That memo, probably more than any other single document, was responsible for the conviction of the tobacco industry uh, by the US Department of Justice uh, of conspiracy to defraud the American people under the RICO, the Racketeering and Corrupt Organizations Act. So here we see the tobacco industry consciously and deliberately following a policy of merchandising doubt. But one of the things that the tobacco industry realized early on was that for this campaign to be affected, effective, they needed scientists. If a tobacco industry executive came up to you and said, well, you know, we don't really think tobacco is so harmful, you wouldn't be so gullible as to think that that was plausible. But if the president of the US National Academy of Sciences said it, then that was a different matter. And so they actively recruited scientists to supply the doubt. And in our book, Merchants of Doubt, then we tell and explain how this same strategy then was used not just to challenge the scientific evidence of tobacco, but a whole set of environmental and public policy issues that included the harms of tobacco, both direct and secondhand, the threat of nuclear winter and this question of SDI, the reality of acid rain, the severity of the ozone hole, and of course, most famously and most significantly, the human causes of global warming. Some of these people are now involved today also in a kind of revisionist attempt to challenge the scientific evidence of the harms of the pesticide DDT. The physicists in our story cast doubt on, er on the science behind every one of these issues. And this for us was like one of the other eureka moments in the story when we realized that the same names, not just the same strategy, but actually the same people were involved in so many of these different things. At one point, we started referring to them as serial contrarians. So in every single case, the strategy was the same, to insist that the science was too uncertain to justify government action. Now, to know how they did it, you'll have to read the book. So what I'd like to spend the rest of the time this evening talking about is why they did it. Why would distinguished scientists attack the work of their own colleagues? 
Why would they disbelieve data published in this very same peer-reviewed journals that they themselves had published their own scientific work during their own careers? So I want to talk about why they did it. And I think that as we come to understand what the political motivations were behind this, we'll also begin to understand why it gained so much traction, especially on the right side of the political spectrum, and why the issue now is so politically polarized. So the short answer is ideology. And specifically the ideology that George Soros has given the term free market fundamentalism. The unshakable belief in the power of free markets to solve our social, economic, and political, and environmental problems. So what is free market fundamentalism? Well, it's probably best understood as an end member of a broader spectrum of belief that go under the term or the label of modern neoliberalism. Modern neoliberalism is focused on the power of deregulation and releasing the so-called magic of the marketplace. It came to prominence in the 1980s under Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom and Ronald Reagan in the United States. And indeed, in Britain today, some of the most prominent climate skeptics on contrarians are people who were active in the Thatcher administration way back in 79, 80, 81. But it's not just conservatives, Tories, and Republicans. And I think this is a really important part of the story. It was promoted throughout the 1990s by the so-called, in the so-called Washington Consensus, led by our president, our Democratic president, Bill Clinton, and UK labor leader, Tony Blair. It was also promoted over the course of more than three, almost four decades, by the head of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan. Throughout the 1990s, and really I would say up until just the last few years with the global financial collapse, there has been a bipartisan consensus in economic and policy circles on the virtues of deregulation. The intellectual, the intellectual roots of neoliberalism can be found primarily in the work of the Chicago economist Milton Friedman who in 1962 published a seminal book, which I highly recommend reading because it really helps explain the kind of way of thinking and psychology behind, uh, behind this whole story. And the crux of Friedman's argument is in his title, Capitalism and Freedom. And his argument is that capitalism and freedom are two sides of the same coin, that they are inextricably linked, that you can't have capitalism without freedom, and you can't have freedom without capitalism. So if you believe in freedom, if you believe in liberty, you must not only believe in capitalism, but you must fight to defend and protect it. Why? Well, he, because he argues, if you look at cases like the Soviet Union or China, mainly he was focused on the Soviet Union, he argued that for states to control markets, the only way they can do that is to control the people who are the actors in those markets. And so once you accept the need for the state intervention in the economic system, it's only a matter of time before the state will begin to control who you visit, where you work, what kind of job you take, what you think, what religion you practice, and we're on the slippery slope to tyranny. In his introduction, Friedman acknowledges his debt to the Austrian neoliberal economist Friedrich von Hayek, who in 1944 published the book Road to Serfdom. Again, the title really sums up the argument. He was a passionate opponent of social democracy in Western Europe, seeing it as part of a slippery slope towards socialism, uh, putting us on the road to serfdom. Now, the contrarians in our story took this argument even further, arguing that environmentalism was the slippery slope to socialism, the road to serfdom. Why? Well, because many environmentalists did argue the need for the government to intervene in the marketplace for regulation of pollution like acid rain or dangerous products like tobacco. And so these men began to argue that from the regulation of acid rain or secondhand smoke, it was only a small step towards government interference in our lives more generally. This idea was articulated in many of their writings, and you can see it in a lot of contrarian, skeptical, and denier uh, literature today. But it was probably articulated most explicitly by a fourth scientist who plays a major role in our story and who joined these campaigns in the 1980s, a man by the name of Fred Singer. Singer's personal biography was strikingly similar to the other three, also a Cold War physicist. In fact, he was the proverbial rocket scientist. And like the others, he was a serial contrarian uh, engaged in campaigns to challenge the evidence of acid rain, global warming, and the ozone hole. Of our four major characters in the story, he's the only one that's still alive. And if you're interested, you can go on the internet and find out that I am a completely corrupt, incompetent, uh, and lying historian of science. <laughs> Actually, according to him, I'm not even a historian at all. 
So here's where the plot gets really interesting. We already mentioned that Seitz had worked for R.J. Reynolds Tobacco from 1979 to 1985. And in the early 1990s, Fred Singer, we find Fred Singer working with the Philip Morris Tobacco Company to attack the Environmental Protection Agency over the issue of secondhand smoke. In 1993, Fred Singer teamed up with a lawyer, Kent Jeffries, who was affiliated with the Cato Institute and the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and published a report which was released with much fanfare, lots of press releases, some congressional support, entitled EPA and the Science of Environmental Tobacco Smoke. Now, when we get to the second story of secondhand smoke in the book, we begin to sort of see a kind of expanding network that helps to explain how this issue then began to spread more widely and more broadly. So who were the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute? Well, if you go to their website, you see that they are, not surprisingly, committed to democracy in America. Sounds like a good idea. But if you ask the question, I'd like to see that too. Uh, <laughs> but if you ask the question, who funded this? The answer is the Tobacco Institute, was, which was itself a supposedly a research organization, but in fact a front for the tobacco industry. And of course, many of you are probably already familiar with the activities of the Cato Institute, and the Competitive Enterprise Institute, again, whose names pretty much tell you what you need to know. So why were these men attacking the EPA? Well, the EPA had declared that secondhand smoke was a class A or proven carcinogen, responsible for thousands of additional adult lung cancer deaths per year, hundreds of thousands of cases of bronchitis and emphysema in infants and young children, and implicated in causing sudden infant death syndrome. This result was affirmed by the US Surgeon General, and it was based on literally thousands of peer-reviewed studies done in the United States, Canada, Japan, Germany, Australia, and elsewhere. So why would a rocket scientist dispute all of this data? Why would he dispute the epidemiology and oncology and public health data? Indeed, why would any scientist challenge this data? Why would any person defend a product that killed infants in their cribs? Well. Fortunately, the great thing about being a historian is how often people answer questions for themselves. And Fred Singer did exactly that. On page two of his report, he wrote, if we do not carefully delineate the government's role in regulating dangers, there is essentially no limit to how much government can ultimately control our lives. So there it is, the Cold War anxiety, the fear of creeping communism, the road to serfdom, the slippery slope to socialism. Today, smoking, tomorrow, the Bill of Rights. And we see this also, this idea then coming up uh, in terms of the idea of any kind of economic regulation as well. And we see this idea then beginning to be applied to the question of climate change. So around the same time in 1993, Fred Seitz launched a major attack on the IPCC. So this was right after the second assessment report had been released. Um, and in attacking, attacking the IPC in the Wall Street Journal, again, not in a scientific journal, but in the Wall Street Journal, Seitz wrote, IPCC reports are often called the consensus view. But if they lead to carbon taxes and restraints on economic growth, they will, um, they will have a major and almost certainly destructive impact on the economies of the world. So a kind of fear of restraint, a fear of regulation. And Frank Luntz, before his conversion, had made essentially the same point, also again in the Wall Street Journal. Once Republicans can see that greenhouse gases must be controlled, it will only be a matter of time before they end up endorsing more economically damaging regulation. And most recently, for those of you who have been following the, uh, I was going to say developing, I started to say unraveling, but that's a Freudian slip, <laughs> the unraveling presidential election. Uh, just a few weeks ago, Mitt Romney, when he was campaigning in New Hampshire, was asked by a man in Hanover, New Hampshire, if he accepted the scientific evidence of the reality of the human causes of climate change, and Mitt Romney said that indeed he did, making him the only one of the current Republican presidential candidates who is prepared to say in public that he accepts the scientific evidence. But when he said that, Newt Gingrich replied that the push to address climate change is the newest excuse to take control of our lives by left-wing intellectuals. And we see this throughout their writings, that contrarians assert that environmentalists, and by implication, scientists working on environmental agendas, uh, environmental issues, have a hidden left-wing political agenda that is anti-business, anti-free market, and anti-technology. 
you know, when Eric gives these talks, he likes to pull out his Blackberry at that point, you know, and start using his technology. <laughs> and indeed, in a number of cases, we actually see the allegation, some cases even the overt accusation, that environmentalists are just socialists in disguise. They refer to environmentalists as watermelons, green on the outside, red on the inside. George Will, who writes for the Washington Post, not generally considered to be a reactionary newspaper, has caused, called environmentalism a green tree with red roots. And Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma, who has threatened to indict climate scientists for conspiracy to lie to Congress, has accused me personally of being part of the liberal conspiracy to bring down global capitalism. <laughs> to which I say that my liberal friends should be so organized. <laughs> And here's what Singer had to say about this question when he wrote about the ozone hole in 1989. And then there are probably those with hidden agendas of their own, not just to save the environment, but to change our economic system. Some of these coercive utopians are socialists. Some are technology-hating Luddites. Most have a great desire to regulate on as large a scale as possible. Why don't you all go home at night and dream up ways to regulate? <laughs> And then again, just a few years later, more dangerous still are those with a hidden political agenda, mo most often oriented against business, the free market, and the capitalistic system. Of course, after the collapse of socialism, it is no longer fashionable to argue for state ownership of industrial concerns. The alternative is to control private firms by regulating every step of every manufacturing process. So here it is. The Cold War is over, and yet still this colossal anxiety about communism, socialism, and the idea that we're all just trying to control everything. So what, all, what does all of this add up to? Well, one of the things it adds up to is the conclusion that this debate was not about the science. You see, in all of these discussions, very little actual discussion of the scientific data, very little actual discussions of the parameterizations of climate models, very little discussions about the methods by which ice core data are collected, almost no discussion of science, actually, at all. What you see here is a tremendous amount of discussion and anxiety, a really anxiety-driven discussion about governance and especially about regulation, driven by an ideological commitment to laissez-faire economics, a belief in the inextricable link between political and economic freedom, and a hostility to regulation as a form of creeping communism, a hostility born and nurtured in the Cold War. Now, of course, this story is filled with ironies, but my favorite irony is this accusation that environmentalism is a green tree with red roots, because, of course, it's completely false. The US environmental movement does not find its origins in the left-wing politics of the early 20th century, the labor movement, or the international workers of the world, or any of the major left-wing movements of the early 20th century, but in the progressive republicanism of Teddy Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and, of course, that famous communist, John D. Rockefeller. <laughs> Right up until the 1960s in the United States, there was a bipartisan consensus on the importance of environmental protection and land preservation, so much so that when the Wilderness Act of 1964 designated American lands where man would be a visitor and does not remain, which is really a pretty radical environmental notion, it passed the US Senate by a vote of 73 to 12 and the House of Representatives by a vote of 373 to 1. In the 1970s, the Environmental Protection Agency, so vilified by the tobacco industry, vilified by Republicans in the House of Representatives today, was created by the Republican President Richard Nixon, who signed into law the key pieces of environmental legislation that represent the backbone of environmental protection in the United States today, including the Clean Air Act, under which the Supreme Court recently ruled that the US government, the EPA, does in fact have the legal not only authority, but responsibility to control greenhouse gases. But things began to change in the 1980s. When scientific evidence began to reveal serious problems like acid rain, the ozone hole, and global warming, problems that seemed to demand government action, problems that seemed to demand regulation, problems that individuals couldn't solve on their own. And these issues emerged in what historians like to call a historical contingency, or ordinary people might just call bad luck, <laughs> these issues emerged just as the Reagan administration was arguing for less government and less regulation, exactly as advocated by Milton Friedman, shown here shaking hands with Ronald Reagan at the White House. And this, I would argue, put the Reagan administration 
And later, the entire neoliberal consensus, supported by many Democrats as well as Republicans, on a collision course with science. Indeed, in a, on a collision course with our future. Now, Ronald Reagan may have had a point. Government regulation is not the solution to every problem. And some environmentalists are socialists. I might even know a few of them. Moreover, the cutting edge of science is always unsettled. There is always uncertainty in science, in any live scientific debate. There's always room for reasonable doubt. But when it comes to questions of public policy, when it comes to making decisions about acid rain or global warming or GMOs or autism and vaccines or any question involving scientific evidence and data, the important question, the relevant question, is what is reasonable? And history shows clearly that the rejection of the scientific evidence regarding DDT, acid rain, the ozone hole, secondhand smoke, wasn't based on reasonable scientific doubt. In fact, it wasn't based on scientific doubt at all. It was based on the desire to avoid government regulation of the products and activities that had created those problems. History also shows that DDT, nuclear winter, acid rain, the ozone hole, and the harms of tobacco were all real problems needing real solutions. Issues where the scientists, our scientists, got it right, and the merchants of doubt were the ones who got it wrong. And finally, and perhaps most important, as we move forward to try to address the problem of global warming, and I think this is actually the most important lesson to me of the last century, is that free market capitalism, like any human institution, has its limits. And the most important limit for this story is what economists call the negative externalities, the costs that accrue to people who did not reap the benefits of the activities that generated them. If you pick up any introductory economic textbook, you will find that environmental damage is the textbook case of a negative externality, a cost that is not reflected in the price of the product. And this, then, is the common thread that unites the diverse science that was challenged by the merchants of doubt, the unifying theme that explains the serial contrarianism, which is otherwise rather perplexing. They all involved market failures. They were all examples of behaviors that generated large external costs and therefore provided a possible warrant for government intervention in the marketplace. Nicholas Stern, the former chief economist of the World Bank, has called anthropogenic global warming the greatest and widest ranging market failure ever seen. So it's not surprising then, I think, when we step back from this issue, that we see that environmentalists, Europeans, and those on the left of the political spectrum were fairly quick to accept the reality of these problems, because for these people, the idea of a government intervention in the marketplace was not problematic. On the other hand, conservatives, libertarians, Americans, and the CEOs of the tobacco industry have been very slow to accept the scientific evidence because for them, it is a problem to accept the reality of the requirement or the necessity of a government intervention. I recently read a very interesting book that I highly recommend to all of you. It's a book called The Failure of Capitalism by the American judge Richard Posner, not generally considered to be a leftist, but who's interested in this question of what can we learn from the global financial crisis about when we do need the government to regulate the market or the uh, fiscal system or banks? And one of the things that he says is that behavior that generates large external costs provides an apt occasion for government regulation. So how we feel about regulation will affect how we feel about that behavior, whether it's smoking or burning fossil fuels. Cognitive science shows very clearly that we're all more likely to accept evidence consistent with our pre-existing worldviews. But as Posner sagely points out, a rational decision maker starts with a prior probability, but adjusts that probability as new evidence comes to his, or I might say her, attention. Although maybe it is his. All of these merchants of doubt are men. <laughs> History tells us that scientists have known for a very long time for more than 100 years, for more than a century, we have known that global warming from burning fossil fuels could occur. And for more than 20 years now, the evidence has been mounting that it is occurring. Evidence that our leading scientific experts tell us is now unequivocal. And of course, one final irony that we should not miss before we close tonight is that the energy sector is not a free market. 
Indeed, the World Bank estimates that global subsidies for fossil fuel production and consumption in the latest year for which we have data, $700 billion. So there's been a lot in the news recently about TARP, the Troubled Assets Recovery Program, also known as the bank bailout. $700 billion to bail out the banks. So the same amount of money that we spent in the bank bailout is being spent every single year around the globe to subsidize fossil fuels. So every single year, we are bailing out the fossil fuel industry. It's an interesting thought. So to conclude, the Industrial Revolution brought the developed world 150 years of unprecedented prosperity, a free lunch of historic proportions. And by and large, that prosperity has been a good thing for those of us who have partaken of it. But what we have learned now what we have learned from scientific work is that that lunch was not actually free. Global warming is the bill, and it is a bill that has now come due. And as the writer Tim, Kim Stanley Robinson has pointed out, the invisible hand never picks up the check. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're about to go on a vacation with your wife and children, or I'll say wife because you're a man, but your family, and 97 of the mechanics who have in, ex, inspected the plane tell you that it is not safe to fly on. But three mechanics uh, hired by the airplane company, not Boeing, of course, but <laughs> three mechanics tell you it's perfectly fine. What are you going to do? So, you know, maybe making it a little more immediate, making it a little bit more obvious, like what we're really talking about, you know, I don't know. In my own experience, it's very hard to say. Different people are different, and I found that you know, it helps to ask the other person some questions about where they're coming from and why they are skeptical about it in order to begin to get at what particularly is bothering them because it's different for different people. And I think what you can argue is different depending on who you are. So for me personally, when I've given this talk in places where it's not just preaching to the choir, one of the things I do is I sometimes spend more time on the science and go into more detail about the evolution and the growth of the scientific knowledge and also what the data, what the specific data were that behind that consensus. And I have often found that people come up to me afterwards and say, wow, I had no idea the science was so old. <laughs> and it's very interesting that for a lot of people that is helpful because they've heard that it's just the latest environmental fad or they've heard it's a liberal conspiracy. But then they see this and they realize, well, first of all, it's not a fad. We've been studying this for 100 years. If it's a liberal conspiracy, it started in Ireland in the 1850s, you know, right? So, you know, knowing the history, I find at least for some people, has been helpful for giving it a slightly different slant. Thank you so much. You're have welcome. you changed any minds? I think so. Yeah, I've gotten some email from people who have said that, you know, that they've adjusted a little bit. So, you know, bit by bit, petit a petit, l'oiseau face only, you know, go ahead. So, my question is, how much of a rhetorical handicap are ethical scientists uh, laboring under? Uh, because I was noticing be in the quotes that you had from the scientists behaving ethically, uh, they properly hedge their statements, saying there is a probability that uh, it is, seems very likely that. Most of the warming, right. Right. Yeah. And then uh, on the other side, because they're not actually arguing from data and from analysis, uh, they don't seem to have, they don't put those hedge words in there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's not even much more I can add to that. You're absolutely right. It's been a huge handicap for the scientific community because scientists are trying to be honest about the uncertainties, about the probabilities, and it makes them, it does handicap them. So the scientific community, um, I mean, one thing I think our book has helped, I think it's actually helped scientists to rethink some of their communication strategies. And I've been invited to a few workshops over the last year by scientists who are grappling with this issue and trying to come up with some more effective ways to communicate that are still honest and ethical, but maybe are a little bit more efficacious in reaching ordinary people. So I'm hopeful that we'll see some positive changes, but it is a really big challenge. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to that moment where you know the link between the sort of Roosevelt, Rockefeller, Pinchot Republicanism, and, the, and when it switches. So I mean, I'm just trying to figure out like what makes I mean, part of it is all of a sudden you're saying the crises emerge and you actually have to do something about them. Um, you know, so you could be more abstract earlier. But what is it in, in our culture, especially recently, that suddenly makes us more vulnerable to 
to lies than maybe we were <laughs> earlier on. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. Or was there all along in our culture? Maybe? Yeah. I don't know that it's so sudden. I mean, I think part of what we see in the story, and, and you know, if you read the book, one of the things you'll see is that part of what we do for every case is we, we go back and we start with, well, how did scientists get involved in this issue in the first place? And in every case, one of the things that we learned, I mean, we learned, we didn't know the science was so old. In every case, we, we discovered the science was older than we had thought, because there's often a long history of research before scientists get to the point where they would say, yes, this is definitely happening. So, um, so it is sort of bad luck, I think, that some of these issues really did kind of coalesce in the late 70s and 80s when Ronald Reagan comes to power, pushing this very, very strong political agenda of less government, less regulation, unleashing the magic of the marketplace, all of those things. So there really is a clash. And many of us are familiar with you know, some of the clashes that took place in the Republican. And they're also going after the whole 40 years of consensus domestically. Right, so they're sort of trying to un right, break that up. And then there is also a shift in the US environmental movement. And we talk about this again in the book. I mean, a lot of the early environmentalism up until the 1970s was really about land preservation. It was a conservationist model, the Gifford Pinchot model, uh, that was actually in some ways very pro-business, right? I mean, the Gifford Pinchot model is about, you know, land of many use, wise use, all that stuff. So it was quite sympathetic to forestry, uh, forest companies. And so, which is not to say that the forest industry loved Gifford Pinchot, because they absolutely did not. If anybody's read the book, The Big Burn by Timothy Egan, you know that. But still, it wasn't really viewed as anti-business by and large, although it was by some people. Uh, but also, it was a kind of patrician environmentalism, right? I mean, Gifford Pinchot you know, was at Yale, came from this very wealthy, aristocratic kind of family, obviously the Roosevelts. So it wasn't a grassroots move, movement. It wasn't associated with left-wing politics. That really did change in the 60s and 70s when a different kind of environmentalism emerged around pollution issues, which were about business polluting the environment, did, in many cases, have a kind of not necessarily anti-business per se, but a critical approach towards what businesses were doing in terms of polluting the air, the water, uh, destroying landscapes and stuff. So the tenor of the environmental movement did change and did become more left-wing, more grassroots, in some ways much more democratic, but in ways that also uh, generated a lot of anger and hostility and backlash in some sectors of the business community. So uh, you know, we go into this in more detail in the book. It's a complicated issue, but I don't think it's that sudden. I think it really builds up over you know, 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, I spent uh, most of my career in public health, uh, much of it and over the last couple of decades in uh, tobacco prevention and control, so parts of this story are very familiar to me. Um, my question is, is that I think as we're all aware, there are many, many scientific issues uh, that impact our lives where there's a, a, a relative, uh, relatively clear consensus, but for which there's a small group of people that disagree. In many cases, that small minority don't achieve uh, a highly visible platform mm. to influence the rest of us and shift the, uh, the opinion of large groups of people. And I know you said the how is in the book, but I wonder if you could share a little yeah, bit, sure, just a little bit more, yeah. maybe a little teaser about yeah. why yeah. it is that this particular group of folks obtained the leverage and the voice that they, that they did in order to shift public opinion. Yeah, well, it's a great question. Of course, we do discuss this in the book, and I hope people will read the book and read more about it. So I'll just give you a little bit. There's really three things. So in the beginning of the story, one thing that it really is crucial is the Cold War. These men were deeply influential because of what they had done in the Cold War. And in some ways, it actually goes back to the atomic bomb. I mean, the atomic bomb really thrust into positions of unprecedented influence, a group of very brilliant men, but who I think also became kind of narcissistic and even egomaniacal, perhaps, because of what they had done in building the atomic bomb. And so they had the ear of the president, congressmen, senators, admirals, generals, and they used it. And so they had access to power. And so when they began to become involved in these other issues, you know, they could pick up the phone and get invited to the White House. And we talk in the book, we talk about one episode where Bill Nuremberg goes to the first Bush, Bush administration and presents this contrarian view of climate science. He's completely out of the mainstream. He has done no research on climate science. He's taking positions that no climate scientist in America would agree with. But yet he's the one who's getting invited to the White House, not the actual climate scientists. So that's one part of it. Second part of it, of course, is that then they begin to make common cause with the fossil fuel industry. And that happens a little later. And so as the story unfolds in the 1990s, we begin to see the fossil fuel industries seeing what these guys are doing and thinking, oh, 
that's kind of good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that works for us. And so we see the fossil fuel industry is beginning to pump money into these think tanks, the Marshall Institute, the Cato Institute, American Enterprise, Competitive Enterprise, Heartland Heritage, those are kind of the big ones. So money is, of course, part of the story. Money comes into it, but not in the sense of these individuals doing it for money, but rather in a kind of confluence of money and ideology that then makes this extremely powerful. And then the third part of it, I think, has to do with the media landscape and also the rise of the internet. Because now, today, if you go on the internet, you see these really preposterous claims being repeated over and over and over again. And many times they use language that someone like me or Eric Conway, who has studied this, we recognize this as language that has come from the Cato Institute or come from the Heartland Institute or even come from the tobacco industry. But now it gets picked up and it gets repeated over and over again. Sometimes I do radio call-ins like I did this morning, and I can hear people saying things that I know what website they've got it off of, you know? And that wouldn't have happened 30 or 40 years ago. So now we are in this much more ch challenging media uh, landscape that makes it much, much more difficult to refute these kinds of claims once they get out into the common uh, vernacular. You talk a lot about the Cold War being an influence on these people's thoughts. And do you see the scientists of, you know, the 30 and younger being um, proponents of these theories or because I mean I grew up with Captain Planet and that kind of idea yeah. and our generation yeah. is different yeah. we don't have the big boogeyman leaning over us and so the idea of you know socialists under the environmental you know crust is not it's foreign yeah. and that's what I was wondering about do you see it continuing past yeah. the current generation of the Cold yeah. War scientists. Well, one thing is there aren't very many of these people under 30. They tend yeah. to be older. <laughs> but, but it's really interesting is how they've managed to keep, to keep this specter of communism alive. So even among people who are younger, people who are you know, too young to really have grown up in a significant way during the, say, the coldest parts of the Cold War, they still raise this issue. You know? So think about like during the uh, health care debate, people talk, you know, Pat Michaels, who's a famous climate skeptic deny or whatever you want to call him, called it Obamunism, you know? I mean, what is that about, right? And the whole healthcare debate, right? We got all these things about it being socialistic and stuff. So they managed to keep this argument alive. And recently I saw something Glenn Beck is quoting uh, Friedrich von Hayek, you know? So it's kind of amazing how you can take a political argument, a political debate from the past that should be dead, that should be irrelevant, and still use it to stir up old anxieties, and maintain old divisions, and, and that is continuing to be done in the right wing in the United States right now. 